Anyway, let's talk about Hamas and Islam. Because almost nobody talks about this. You just don't hear it. And this, this, is, this, is, this is true after 9-11. You, you, you know, the, the authorities at least. But a lot of even just commentators. Al-Qaeda were terrorists. What was that? Terrorists. We had a war on terrorism. That's it, terrorism. Um, there was no real, and indeed, more than that, uh, according to President Bush, Islam was a religion of peace. Uh, Islam was, uh, you know, Islam was not fault for 9-11. Islam was not a fault for Al-Qaeda. Al-Qaeda was some kind of aberration, a hijacking of a great and very peaceful religion. And the same is happening around Hamas. Almost nobody mentions the fact that Hamas is an Islamist organization. That everything it does, including the raping of women and the torturing of children and the torturing of adults, it does under the banner of Islam. Indeed, it received special permission. The, its soldiers received special permission before entering Israel on October 7th from an imam in Gaza to rape because Muslim soldiers are not supposed to do that unless they get permission. And then they get permission, then it's okay. They literally got permission. There's almost nothing made of the fact that Hamas is not just a group of thugs who just want power, who are just, you know, uh, uh, masochists who want to see people suffer. They, for some inexplicable reason, hate Jews. It, also, nothing is made of the fact that uh, Hamas is just not another nationalist organization that just wants to establish a Palestinian state, any Palestinian state. And we heard from the Bernie Sanders advisor that Hamas just wants to establish a Palestinian state that looks like America, with a diverse group of people, all free, all enjoying individual rights under a rule of secular law. Where does this come from? The reality is that Hamas represents a major strand of Islam, a, 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 a strand that is probably, I, probably you have hundreds of millions, depending on the survey and depending on how you ask the question, hundreds of millions of Muslims around the world who support it. Hamas is not some aberration. It's not something crazy. It's not something out of the norm. Indeed, Hamas grew out of the Muslim Brotherhood movement. Hamas is a political, a, a military, sorry, a military arm of the Muslim Brotherhood of Palestine. The Muslim, the Muslim Brotherhood, as a political entity in Egypt, won the election right after the Arab Spring. Indeed, one could argue that the Muslim Brotherhood was the organization most responsible for the Arab Spring. Indeed, even in Syria, where there's a civil war, those fighting Bashar al-Assad are often Muslim Brotherhood, or people inspired by it, the Muslim Brotherhood of Syria. There is a very active Muslim Brotherhood organization in Jordan and pretty much everywhere else. It is the Gulf states and Saudi Arabia that are truly afraid of the Muslim Brotherhood, although Saudi Arabia for many years, actually was a bastion of the Muslim Brotherhood as they were kicked out of Egypt in the 1960s and, uh, and early 70s. They were kicked out of Egypt and they went and taught in Saudi Arabia. Indeed, it's Muslim Brotherhood teachers who taught bin Laden. Bin Laden got his theology from the Muslim Brotherhood that led him to found Al-Qaeda. Al-Qaeda was an organization, a terrorist organization, 
but an organization that shared an ideology with the Muslim Brotherhood, as, as did ISIS, with some variation. ISIS is maybe more militant. ISIS focuses much more on hatred of the Shia, uh, Shia Islam, which dominates Iran, but the Shia is everywhere, really, in the Muslim world. ISIS hates the Shia almost as much as they hate non-Muslims. Uh, Muslim Brotherhood doesn't really have a, a huge problem with the Shia and certainly doesn't place them in the same category as Jews or Christians. So what you have uh, with Hamas is basically a, milita a, a military wing of the overall Muslim Brotherhood movement. The Muslim Brotherhood movement is a movement that is, has a significant presence in pretty much every Muslim country, I'd say a Sunni Muslim country in the world, including in the Far East, including in places like, uh, like Indonesia and Malaysia, there are significant Muslim Brotherhood chapters over there. So what does the Muslim Brotherhood represent? The Muslim Brotherhood was founded in, in the late 1920s by, um, uh, by oh God, I forget his first name, but Albana, uh, was his, uh, was his, um, uh, you know, uh, it was his uh, family name, if you will. Um, and uh, it was founded in Egypt. And basically what the Muslim Brotherhood advocates for is Islam. Islam as the ideology that must, uh, the ideology of God, the ideology that must you know, dominate the world. Not just the Muslim world, but must dominate the world. Uh, the Muslim Brotherhood uh, claims that the problems the Muslim world has, the reason the Muslim world is weak, the reason the Muslim world is poor, is because it has become too secular. It is because it does not take religion seriously enough. Hassan Elbana, sorry, Hassan Elbana is his name. It is because it, it is because it doesn't take it enough. It, because it has sinned against God by compromising on the principles of Islam, compromising on the principles of the Quran, it is because of that that the Muslim world has been punished with the rise of the West, has been punished with weakness and poverty, has been punished with the fact that the West has militarily far stronger than they are. And that explains this punishment by God for not living up to the principles of Islam explains their weakness. And that the only way for the Muslim world to rise up again and dominate and achieve what the great Arab empires and the great Ottoman Empire has achieved, which was not quite world domination, but came close. Massive, huge empires. They were the mightiest forces in the world by far. The only way, the only way that can be achieved, that can be returned, you can return to that glory of wealth and success, and even science and all of that, is a return to religion, to return to the Quran, a return to a consistent reading of the Quran, a consistent reading of religion. The Muslim Brotherhood advocates consistently, consistently, that the West is inherently corrupt, inherently decadent, inherently on the verge of failure, and it will indeed fail. It will indeed fail. Once, once Islam returns to the foundation, ultimately God will reward virtue, will not allow vice. And the reality is that the Western world is driven by vice. And therefore, once the Muslim world regains its commitment to the Quran, its commitment to Islam, it will regain God's favor and therefore become the strongest power on the planet. And they are willing to wait. They realize that their primary 
responsibility is to educate Muslims to be better Muslims, to bring Muslims back to Islam, to dominate Muslim countries. They thought they had a shot in Egypt, and they kind of blew it. They, they had a Muslim Brotherhood president, but he pissed off the military, and he was gone after a while. But, uh, you know, the Muslim Brotherhood is patient. All its different branches are patient. Now, uh, you know, the reason they're willing to work, for example, with Iran, which is Shiite and not Sunni, is because, you know, even though the Shiites are wrong, they're still working on the side broadly of Islam, and they're willing to, you know, Hamas would be willing to work with anybody. The Muslim Brotherhood is willing to work with anybody for the defeat of evil, for the defeat of the West, for the defeat of the non-Muslims. So, uh, you know, uh, Hamas is not some aberration. It's not some thing out of nowhere. It is, a, it is an organization of the Muslim Brotherhood, which is a massive organization within the Muslim world. And a massive organization committed to one thing. And that is practicing Islam the way they interpret it, consistent with its origins. And part of that is the idea, and part of the sinfulness of the Islamic world for which they are paying a price under God, is the fact that the Muslims have allowed non-Muslims a foothold on Muslim territory. According to the Quran, according to the traditions, once a place is Muslim, it can never go back. Once a place is Muslim, it must always be Muslim. That is, it must always be ruled, owned by Muslims. It, 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 there cannot be, for example, a Jewish state. They cannot be, not because they particularly, you know, not because necessarily it's just about Jews, but they cannot be a Jewish state in a place that used to be Muslim. Now, ultimately, they all agree the whole world needs to become Muslim, right? The whole world needs to be conquered by Islam, and only, you know, that is an acceptable outcome, and this is why it's a global jihad. And this is why when, when those students shout global jihad or, or, or global intifada, global intifada, what that really means in, in, the, in the current terminology, in the current context, in the context of Hamas, is a global jihad. And what that means is the conversion of the entire world to Islamic rule, to living under Sharia law. And it can never be changed. It can never be changed. So the biggest sin Israel has committed is taking Muslim land, taking a land ruled by Muslims under the Ottomans and under the Arab empires before that, and making it into non-Muslim. And that is just unacceptable, unthinkable, really. And, you know, they're willing to wait as many generations as it take, takes to recapture that land. It, this is not about, um, it, this is not about we have to capture it by the end of the year, we have to catch it tomorrow. That's why I don't think Hamas is panicking because they're losing in Gaza. They're not going anywhere. Their ideology is not going anywhere. Even if they die... The ideas keep going, and they're going to heaven, and they'll look down and observe the progress. You know, Nasrallah, who is the leader of Hezbollah, which is Hezbollah, is similar to Hamas. It's just from the Shiite branch. Once said, the reason we will win is because we think in terms of centuries. The West thinks in terms of years. Nasrallah knows he will die before he sees 
Sharia rule over Lebanon and Palestine. I think he knows that. He doesn't care. He also knows he's fighting for a cause that is forever. And that ultimately, he believes God is on the side of that cause and therefore will win. And you can't understand, you can't understand um, uh, Hamas, you can't understand the Palestinians, you can't understand the Arab world, the Muslim world, if you don't understand this, if you don't understand the extent to which they are truly committed to this, and to the extent to which this is, a, 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 this is the belief system they have. Now, that doesn't mean they can't change. They can. They have free will. But it means that this is the dominant ideology, and to uproot it would require a real thrashing. And it's not even a military thrashing. Indeed, it's actually the case that even if Israel really defeated Hamas with overwhelming force, unencumbered by rules of engagement and so-called morality of war and all of that, it really crushed them. It still wouldn't win. Unless it was also willing to say, what we are defeating is not just the Palestinian people. Notice, not just Hamas, but not just Hamas and not just the Palestinian people. What we are defeating today is the ideology of Islamism, the ideology of Islamic totalitarianism, the ideology that believes that they can impose Sharia law on the world, on us, on anybody. And what we're defeating it is in the name of an alternative in the name of individualism, in the name of reason, in the name of Western civilization, in the name of the Enlightenment, in the name of a superior ideology represented by superior weapons. But ultimately, what makes it superior is its advocacy for truth, its advocacy for ideas that are consistent with human nature, and its rejection, thoroughly rejection, of religion, but more broadly, of mysticism. The real battle with Islam is an ideological one. We have to first know what we're fighting on our side. And we have to know, so we have to know our own virtues. We have to know our own value. And even if it's at the level of we're fighting for enlightenment values. Even at a level of, we're fighting for reason and individualism. We're fighting for political freedom. That would be great, even if they don't get objectivism. Just that. And then we need to know what we're fighting against. We need to know that the enemy is a religious entity. Enemy. An enemy that believes that it has revealed truths that is superior to everybody else. And the only way to dislodge those truths is to prove to them that they are not. To prove to them that they will be defeated. To prove to them that their ideology is primitive, barbaric, anti-man, anti-life. And you do that with military victory and a clear message of the superiority of your own ideas. Hamas is not interested in establishing a Palestinian state. It will never, ever, 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 even if they say they do, they will never give up on the idea of throwing the Jews out of Palestine, where they're killing them all, putting them on boats, basically making the entire area there, the entire state of Israel, a Muslim state. That is a foundational idea of their ideology, not just their political charter, of their fundamental ideology, of their religious ideology. Jews cannot have a state on Muslim land, period, ever. So 
once a, a, a Muslim Brotherhood preacher, this is, this is in 2000, when the PLO was negotiating with Ehud Barak, and Israel almost gave the Palestinians everything they wanted, almost everything, um, except the right of return, so the Palestinians from refugee camps could come back into Israel proper and take over their old homes and just live there. Anyway, this uh, Muslim Brotherhood doctor of religion was asked if it would be permissible for Palestinian refugees to give up their land in Israel in exchange for compensation from, from the Israelis. If the Israelis would compensate them for it, would they, could they give it up? And this is some of what he said. He said, the answer to your question is that a Muslim may sell land that is owned by him to whom he wants at the price that he wants if he is selling to a citizen like himself. For in this case, while the land would be changing hands, it would remain generally within the circle of public property of the Ummah, the nation of Islam. And the deed to it should not be shifted to another nation. As to selling land or conceding it for any compensation, however high it may be, to another nation, be it represented by a state or the nationals of the state, it would be wrong by all means. Waiving the right to Muslim land is not only haram, forbidden by Sharia, it is one of the gravest sins which make those who do them commit the great unbelief, apostasy. Furthermore, this land does not belong to those who own it and hold the deed to it. It is not the property of the Palestinian people alone. In fact, it is the property of the Muslim nation in all parts of the world and should be defended with life and ev by every means at the disposal of Muslims. Islam stipulates for Muslims a religious duty if a part of their land is occupied by force by their enemies. This duty is that Muslims should go to war to restore that part and drive the enemy out of it, whatever the cost. Such fighting is a duty of all the people of the country, men and women alike. Now that is not an ideology you can negotiate with. That is not an ideology you can sign a peace deal with. That is not an ideology that is going to cede you one inch of land. And it's funny because if you've watched the debate I did with, uh, with um, uh, Saif, the Palestinian libertarian, who argued from the perspective of, of property rights, this basically means that there is no such thing as property rights for non-Muslims in Islam that ultimately Muslims can take property away from anybody who's not a Muslim. And suddenly there's no property rights under Islam for a state that is not Muslim. That is for the people in a state that is not Muslim. Right? I mean, he literally says that the property, uh, the property is not of the Palestinian people alone. It's the property of all Muslims. That's not property rights. That's pure and utter collectivism. And he says, base, he says that to sell Muslim land to a people of another nation would be haram and would be the gravest of sins, which would make you apostate. Now, if you take religion seriously, you do not want to be an apostate. <laughs> you do not want to be an apostate. <sighs> so again, there is no, there is no negotiating with 
anybody affiliated with the Muslim Brotherhood. There was no negotiating with Hamas. There was no negotiating, settling with anybody who believes in Sharia law, Iran, Hezbollah. Literally, the only option Israel has is the complete and utter destruction of this ideology and the people who represent it. It's a complete and utter bringing them to their knees. Because they cannot compromise. They cannot compromise. If they compromise, i.e., they allow Jews to stay in, they allow Israel to exist, or they allow Israel to exist even as a tiny little place, even smaller than it is today, or they allow Jews to own land that was one Muslim or whatever, they are, cre they are apostates and they will die. So you, you, you can't understand their commitment to death without understanding their religion. And this is their religion. Now, I'm not saying this is Islam because uh, others interpret Islam differently and I don't get into theological debates about what Islam actually means. This is their interpretation of Islam. This is how they interpret Islam. This is how they understand Islam. And unless we understand the nature of our enemy, there is no way to defeat an enemy you don't understand. There's no way to defeat an enemy you can't name. You have to know who they are, what they are, what they represent, what they stand for in order to defeat them. Hamas represents Islamic totalitarianism. Hamas is an Islamist group. Hamas is representative of tens of millions, maybe hundreds of millions of Muslims who believe in this version of Islam. Hamas is part of a Muslim Brotherhood network that extends across the world. It's in Europe. It's in mosques in the United States. It's everywhere that needs to be crushed, needs to be crushed because is militant and committed to the destruction of the West and committed to establishing Sharia law through coercion on all of us. And this is life or death. This is something we must fight. And it's shocking, shocking that the United States is not embracing Israel completely and supporting everything that it does and more given that we face exactly the same enemy here in the United States as Israel does, that Hamas and the Islamist movement generally is an enemy of the West, is an enemy of the United States. And those who side with Hamas are... are Ignorant, evasive, and in many cases, evil. Because once you understand what these people stand for, death and destruction, Sharia law on the entire world, once you understand that, supporting them can, you know, is, is an act of evil. And a American administration, any American administration, that, that weakens Israel's hand in its ability to destroy Hamas is committing an evil act.